Okay, so the last time we were here, we were working on this acid strength stuff, um, and we were starting to look at the difference between a strong acid and a weak acid. Right now, we've looked at that where we know we memorize the seven strong acids, and if it's not one of the seven strong acids, then it is a... It's a weak acid. Um, what we want to do is kind of figure out what does that mean in terms of their equilibrium position because that's the major difference between a strong acid and a weak acid. Um, strong acids, the equilibrium lies far to the right. And it's not even the equilibrium lies far to the right. It doesn't even have an equilibrium. Yes, no. Is there an equilibrium? No, because what kind of arrow does this get? It gets a one-way arrow because so it's kind of a misnomer here to say equilibrium because in order to have equilibrium, it really needs to go back the other direction. But in this particular case, um, with our strong acids, it doesn't. It stays far to the right. Um, I am going to switch this out. We're not going to call this HA, and I think we made that fix last time, didn't we? Uh, all of the acid has dissociated, We're taking that HA out because remember we reserve HA for weak acids. For example, if you don't know the formula of a weak acid, you could just plop in HA and it'll work. Uh, yield a weak conjugate base um, or a poor conjugate base has a very low attraction uh, for a proton. If you remember back a couple slides where we were looking at um, the two bases and they were competing for the hydrogen ions, the conjugate bases that we get from the strong acids are really bad at getting those um, hydrogen ions. In fact, um, they are a worse base than water. Water is better at attracting a hydrogen ion than the conjugate bases that are produced from these strong acids. And once again, there are only seven of these strong acids. You've got to memorize those. For the weak acids, the equilibrium lies far to the left. You could actually kind of look at the equilibrium like this where we have a much longer arrow going back to the left and a shorter arrow going um, to the right. The weak acids do dissociate a little bit. And if you go back and think about what we've been doing with um, molecular species and double replacement, um, like if you've got form HF or acetic acid, have we been breaking those apart? No, hopefully you didn't have graded your quiz yet. Hopefully you haven't been breaking those apart. Um, we said that they stay together. Well, that's actually not true. They do dissociate a little bit, but it's very minimal. They dissociate less than 5%. So that's why we have just a little bit going that direction and mostly it coming back because they don't dissociate very much. Um, that 5% should sound familiar to you. Do you remember when we used that before? with the small k, with the 5% approximation, it developed from these weak acids that we proved that they dissociate less than 5%, so we can use that small k problem. So most of the acid is still present as HA. That's why when we do those double replacement reactions, we just go ahead and leave everything together because most of it is present in that form. Now, they make great uh, conjugate bases. Their conjugate bases are much stronger than water. So what we find is we have the conjugate base of a strong acid. Then we have water. And then the strongest base, well, not this, I need to take that back, because what would be, a what bases would be stronger than a strong conjugate base from a weak acid? The strong base is the one that has the hydroxide. So then we'd have the uh, conjugate base of HA, of our weak acid, and then we'd have any of those strong bases that have the hydroxide. That, that's a part of them. So this is order of increasing strength. And I think I actually devoted the next slide to this. 
Um, another thing to keep in mind, strong acids, do they have Ka values? No, if they don't have an arrow going both directions, then there's no way for it to have a Ka value as well. Now, some books report their Ka values as being extremely large. Well, that makes sense because if it's all product and no reactant, then that should be whatever those concentrations are of those particular uh, re uh, products that you're forming. So it would be huge. Uh, weak acid problems are all going to fall into being a small K problem every single time. So if you didn't get real good at small k before, you're going to get really good at small k um, now because every weak acid problem we work, every weak base problem we work is going to be that small k problem. So uh, dissociating a, a few acids, one of the things you always want to look at is first, am I dealing with a strong acid or am I dealing with a weak acid? And so we have HCl up here. What is this? So let's mark it. And strong acids do what? Dissociate. Completely dissociate. That was even, I noted it here, with the arrow only going one direction. That also tells us it completely dissociates. And so we get a hydrogen ion and a chloride ion. We like the strong acids because it's really easy to find pH. You just have to know the concentration of the hydrogen, and you can just use the formula to find pH. Strong acids do not require ice at all or a, using the Ka value. So those are easier of the two types of problems to do. Um, now, how would we classify ammonium? Weak acid, it's not one of the seven strong, right? It's not, we have hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic, perchloric, chloric, sulfuric, and nitric. It's not one of those. So that automatically makes it a weak acid. What's the dead giveaway and what I gave you up here, though? Double arrow tells us as well. Um, so what does this become? When it dissociates, what is it going to dissociate into? Say it again. Ammonia. And what else? Well, now, where do you get water from? <laughs> no, there's no ammonium hydroxide here. It's just ammonia. So, in order to be an acid, you have to produce a what? Hydrogen. So, it has to have that hydrogen ion as well. And notice in each case, they're staying balanced. But the other thing I want you to notice, the charges are staying balanced as well. Does this have any overall charge on it, the HCl? No, it's zero. What happens when you add the positive one and the negative one together? It cancels out. You get zero again. Here, ammonium has an overall charge of plus one. Do we have a plus one over here? Yeah, so in that dissociation process, you're going to maintain, make sure it's balanced not only for the number and types of atoms that are present, but also want to make sure those charges um, are balanced as well. Oh, I thought I took this one off. Do you have this one in your sheet? Okay. We'll skip it. The, this, is, this is what you were dealing with in your lab. This is a complex ion. And you, what you found about complex ions is they have really pretty what? They have really pretty colors associated with them. Whenever you're looking to figure this, is, I'll do a little lab talk here right now. Whenever you're trying to figure out the major species, write this down. The major species is not the stressor. You could even say the major species and the minor species are not the stressors. Those major species and those minor species have to be those complex ions that are present. So don't ever put chloride in. Chloride 
doesn't have any associated color with it. All of those complex ions are the ones that give us those really brilliant colors that we're looking at. Um, occasionally, we have some diprotic acids, or all of these acids up here. Well, I lied. Only this acid up here is monoprotic. It has one. That's typically what we deal with. Um, there are some acids that are um, polyprotic, um, or uh, which means they'll have um, three or more. Um, and we have some diaprotic. The only one we ever really deal with diaprotic is sulfuric acid. And notice with the sulfuric acid, the first dissociation is what? What kind of? Weak or strong? Strong, but it only loses one hydrogen at a time. This is a very strange thing with acids. You only lose a single hydrogen at a time. Each, so there, however many hydrogens are present is how many dissociations could occur. Each dissociation is a weaker and weaker dissociation. So this one will be strong, but when we go to the next one, this dissociation is weak because we have the arrow going both directions. Yes. So we don't have to call it triprotic, we typically call it polyprotic. Once it gets past two, they're polyprotic. So phosphoric acid would actually go through three dissociations, except with phosphoric, all of them are weak. And the more dissociations you go through, the weaker and the weak, weaker the acid gets. So this first one here, this was a strong acid, but then when we come to the second one, it's a weak acid. I had a feeling they were going to pop up. That's okay. So we want to know how to dissociate our acids. That's the key to get through this from this slide is that strong acids dissociate with a single arrow going one direction. Weak acids dissociate with a double-headed arrow. It needs to go back and forth. Okay, so we need to talk a little bit um, about Ka values. Um, you're going to need to look up Ka values in order to determine the relative strength of your acid. So then you'll know the relative strength of its conjugate base um, that it forms. The Ka is inversely proportional to the base strength. So as your Ka gets smaller and smaller, so as the Ka gets smaller, so meaning we'll move from times 10 to the negative third to times 10 to the negative seventh, times 10 to the negative 14th, they just get smaller and smaller, the conjugate base strength goes up. The weaker the acid, the better the base you can produce. Oh, and I forgot, I put a little animation in there. The weaker the acid, you'll see a lower Ka, lower, or you can also think of that as a smaller Ka. The stronger the conjugate base you'll have out of that. The one, so you get a better base, it's better at accepting that hydrogen ion. And so we have these um, bases that we want to organize. Now, in order to organize these bases, we actually need to look at what kind of acid did they come from. And hopefully, did I leave the next slide? Go back there. Let me add a slide in here. Um, so you need to get your textbook out and 
you're good. Your textbook is probably already has the page marked in it for the KA values. Uh, if you haven't uh, marked page 658 with a post-it or a flag or it's not marked in your textbook already, that's the page you want to mark, page 658. And so these were the bases that we were looking at. Page 658. They're probably already marked. Uh, yes. So what we're going to do is we first need to figure out um, what acids these came from in order to start organizing um, our bases. And I believe we want to organize these in increasing base strength. So we want the weakest base here. We want the strongest base over here. And what's going to be in the middle of them both? What? Water's going to be in the middle of them. Okay, so in order to figure out what acid they came from, all you have to do is add a what to each of these? Add an H to them. So I'll put the acids up above in red. So fluoride came from hydrofluoric. Is that strong or weak? We know that that's a weak acid. Chloride came from hydrochloric. And what do we know about that one? Strong. Careful here, this is not nitrate. This is nitrite. So it came from nitrous acid, which is strong or weak? Weak. And we have cyanide, and what did it come from? Hydrocyanic acid. Yeah, if you needed help with the names, you can look at your table there. They have them in there, right? <laughs> Give you a little help. Okay, so of the things that we have up here, which one is the poorest base? HCl, why is HCl our poorest base. Well, no, let's, it's not HCl that's the poorest base. Why is chloride the poorest base? Well, it has the highest Ka, or even a more general statement, it came from a strong acid, and strong acids produce the worst bases. So our worst base is chloride. Now, everything else came from a weak acid. Um, so, what should come after our chloride? Water should come next, because in between the weakest of the bases and the best bases, there always have water in between. So, we'll have water in between. Now, for the strongest base, we want what kind of Ka value? We lowest. The strongest base will have the lowest Ka value. Who has the, long, the lowest Ka value on here? Hydrocyanic acid. It's to the negative tenth. So that makes it our best base or our worst base? It's our best base. 
Okay, going up from there, what do we run into next? We run into nitrous next, so that makes, but before cyanide comes what? Nitrite. And then what does that leave in between water and nitrite? That leaves the fluoride. Um, and looking at Ka values, the fluoride was the negative fourth. This one was the negative tenth. What was the nitrite? Negative? Oh, it was a negative four as well. Just a little bit. I have to look at the coefficient on that one. So our weakest base comes from what kind of acid? Strong acid. Our strongest base comes from the weakest acid. Yes, yes. Now, you don't have to memorize Ka values. I will supply you with every Ka value you need. Uh, so you don't have to worry about it. I'll give you a chart or something for you to be able to analyze the data um, from that. Nobody memorizes Ka values. Any other questions? So to kind of put it all together, um, I, we're relating acid base strength to the conjugate. The weakest acid gives us the what? Strongest base. Now, what comes in between the strongest base and the weakest base? Water's in between. And the strong acids always give us the weakest bases. Now, we haven't talked about the bases yet, but I wanted to show you that the, the same similarity um, exists. A weak base will give us what kind of conjugate acid? Give us the strongest conjugate acid. What do you think's in the middle again? Water's in the middle again. And the strongest base gives us the, the weakest acid. Now, the weak component where you're looking at the strongest bases up here, you'd have to compare Ka values in order to determine that. What do you think you have to compare down here? If these are KAs, these are KBs. The nice thing about this is once you learn how to do everything for an acid, there's only one small change to be able to do it all for a base, and it's minor compared to the bulk of work you have to do. Um, so once you learn one, you've automatically got the other one. Um, so we kind of talked about this other term a little bit uh, the other day. Do you remember us mentioning this word, amphoteric? What's the most famous amphoteric substance of all? Water is the most famous amphoteric substance. Uh, it's a substance that can behave as either an acid or a base. Uh, that's why I like to write water as HOH. Because it starts with an H, which is acid, and it has OH, which is a base. So it's, that makes it really easy to remember that this is an infoteric um, substance. And water does this thing um, where it auto-ionizes. And notice, what kind of arrow do we have on this? 
we have the equilibrium, we have the double-headed arrow. So that bottle of water that's sitting on your desk right now, it's doing this. It is auto-ionizing. It is producing hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions and then going back and forming water um, again. Where do you think the equilibrium lies? I think it lies far to the right or far to the left. But we also got to think about it. We think it's a very good acid or a base. Now it kind of fell in the middle. There's actually a KW value for this. So we've got KA for acid dissociation. KB for base dissociation, and now we have KW, which is the auto-ionization of water or the constant, something like that. I don't remember exactly what it is. It's 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14th. What does that tell you? Where does it lie? No, let's say, go back here, compare K to 1. It's K less than, greater than, or equal to 1. It's way less than 1. So where does our equilibrium lie? In your water bottle, you actually have mostly what? Water. You mostly have H2O. It's not doing that part very much. Now, the tricky thing about KWs is they change based on temperature. Um, this is the KW for when we're at 25 um, degrees Celsius, 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14th at 25 degrees Celsius. You have to memorize this one. This one, you'll use it so much that you'll just memorize it through usage. You won't actually have to work, concentrate on it. And notice here, when I have this KW equals the hydrogen ion concentration times the hydroxide ion concentration, this is the what? The thing I make you write every single time. I take two points off if you don't. The, the equal, yeah, I knew it would that take two points off. You'd remember what it is. The equilibrium expression. And so at 25 degrees Celsius, this is always true. The KW equals the hydrogen ion times the hydroxide ion concentration. And we happen to already know what the value of the KW is. It's at 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14. This becomes a very useful equation. Uh, we actually end up using this equation to solve for the hydrogen ion concentration or the hydroxide ion concentration. And it's one you tend to ignore, but it's actually, it's a little equation that can make life so much easier. So you make sure you highlight that and don't ignore this one. This is the one I'll say, like when you come and say, I don't know how to work this problem, I'll say go look at the KW, because typically that gets you out of most of your issues. Um, now, there are three possible situations that we can have here. Um, each time the KW is going to be equal to 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14th. And so the possible situations we can have is we can have a neutral situation, which is what we like to think about our water, has a pH um, of 7, where our hydrogen equals our hydroxide. We can have an acidic situation. Uh, where our hydrogen ion concentration is greater than our hydroxide ion concentration. Or it can be basic, where our hydrogen ion concentration is less than our hydroxide ion concentration. What do you think these three things are leading up to? Being able to calculate what? Yeah, we have to be able to calculate um, pH because for pH, we need to know which one of these, hydrogen or hydroxide. We need to know the hydrogen. Now, there's not only a pH, there's also a pOH. And so there it would be based off of the hydroxide ion concentration. 
So basically our pH scale is a convenient way um, to represent acidity because typically those concentrations that we're looking at are really, really small. And so looking at something that's 1 times 10 to the negative 6 doesn't really mean anything to you. When I say it has a pH of 6, what does that tell you then? That it is acidic. It's acidic. Now, everybody wants to know, well, what, do, what does P mean in pH? Anytime you have a P in front of anything, this means negative log of whatever that thing is. So in this case, negative log of our question mark. But if it's pH, it'd be the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. If it's pOH, it'd be the negative log of the hydroxide. What if it's pKa? Negative log of the Ka. So basically, what I want you to understand is anytime you see a P in front of it, that means just take the negative log of it. That's all you have to do. Um, we'll talk about that exponent thing when we look at coefficients. We're not always going to have a coefficient of 1. I think that's what you're alluding to. Um, okay. So these are the super helpful equations. These are the ones that you also say, oh, I don't know how to do this problem. I'm like, go look at your super helpful equations. These are the best ones. So I put uh, here both the pH and the pOH. Notice they're both the um, negative log. Whoa, I messed these up. These are fine. These are fine. I left something out of these. So let me fix that real quick. I left the negative out. There, so it's fixed. So if you have the pH, it's possible to go back to the hydrogen ion concentration. Um, I a lot of times call this inverse log, but this is also second log. So if you want to remember the actual buttons to push on your calculator, it's second, then log, negative, put in your pH, put in your pOH. There's somebody at the door. I threw this one in here just in case you wanted to see if you ever had to do a pKa or a P, uh, pKb. It's just a negative log again. This is the best equation ever. pH plus pOH equals 14. This is great because a lot of your questions will ask you to um, solve for multiple things. Solve for the pH, the pOH, the hydroxide ion concentration, the hydrogen ion concentration, all of these different things. This is a quick and easy little formula that gets you from one to the other really fast and easy. So you definitely, I would highlight this whole slide. I would take my highlighter and ring the slide in your highlighter color because this one is super important. It's got all the good things you need. And for those of you who just came in, if you notice, I'm recording it. So whatever you missed, you'll be able to watch uh, later on the wiki page. Um, now, I don't think I put this particular slide in. I think I took it out because it doesn't print very well on yours. But this is the, the pH scale that you are um, familiar with. Um, there's also a pOH scale as well. So on the pOH scale, instead of this being acidic, what do you think this is? It's basic down here, and it is acidic on the other end. It just um, flip-flops. Okay, so pH of strong acid solutions. Uh, to determine the pH, we need to consider, oh, your favorite thing again, major species. 
uh, those components present in relatively large amounts. There'll be lots of species present. We just want to figure out what's the most important species, which one is actually impacting um, the pH. Uh, so let's look at uh, one molar hydrochloric acid. Uh, hydrochloric acid is strong or weak? Strong acid. So tell me how that dissociates, completely or incompletely? Completely, so it gets an arrow going one way. Uh, no, when it's one way, it's strong. When it's both ways, it's weak. No. And do that. Um, and so because this completely um, dissociates, it's not even that it contains virtually no HCl, it really has no HCl at all. Really, all we have here are we're going to have hydrogen ions, we're going to have chloride ions, and I put water here. Why do we have to have water? Because it's what makes it dissociate is what separates the things out that gets hydrated um, with the water. So if we wanted to calculate the pH of one molar hydrochloric acid, I'm going to just rewrite this again so we can put in our molarities. We have one molar HCl. What I want to figure out is what is the molarity of hydrogen present? And what is the molarity of the chloride present? This completely dissociates. Everything here becomes something over here. Uh, all we need to do is use our mole ratios. And the lovely thing about this is our mole ratios are all what? One. Everything's in a one-to-one -one ratio. So if I have one molar HCl, what molarity of hydrogen do I have? It's one. And if I have one molar uh, hydrochloric acid, I have one molar chloride. Now, if you do not believe me, let me mathematically show you how this is true. One molar HCl, mole of HCl on bottom, mole of H on top, what's the mole ratio between the two things? One to one. So HCl cancels, moles cancel, one molar hydrogen ions. You can do the stoichiometry if you want to, but about 99% of the time, it's a one to one ratio, so there's really no reason um, to do that. So we want to find the pH of this. Um, what do we do to find pH? pH equals the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. What is the negative log of 1? That's why I had to have, have your calculators out. What's pH? Zero. That is, well, you know, the P, on the pH scale, it can actually go negative. Yeah. So that 1 to 14 is just typically where things fall. Um, but the, for instance, the other day in your lab, let me show you something. Let me add a slide in. The other day in your lab, you were using hydrochloric acid, right? And the stuff you used over in the fume hood was one molar. It had pH of zero. In tray four, I think, you had that concentration of hydrochloric acid. Do you remember the one you opened and it kind of fumed a little bit and smelled? That was 15 molar. 
So if we have 15 molar HCl, what's the hydrogen ion? 15 molar. What is the chloride? 15 molar. Let's do pH equals the negative log of 15. What's the pH? Negative 1.17. Yes, you would have felt that if you got it on your skin. That's why we had our gloves on. So it wouldn't be an issue. So this is the kind of the, the exact same procedure that you work through um, for every um, strong acid. Um, now if you notice when we went back here, we did talk about um, we needed to talk about the major species, and we listed those major species. But whenever it is a strong acid, typically what's the most major species? We're talking about a strong acid. The most major species is always going to be the hydrogen ion, unless we really drop the molarity of that acid, which is actually the next example um, that we're going to look at, where it says calculate the pH of 0.1 molar nitric acid and the pH of 1.0 times 10 to the negative 10th molar hydrochloric. I think we're going to skip the nitric example um, because nitric works no different than HCl. What I want to do is show you how the concentration it starts to impact um, the pH. So let me add one more slide in. And we want to first, I'm going to switch off from red. That's really abrasive. We want to find the pH of, what is it, 1.0 times 10 to the negative 10th molar. That's not very concentrated, is it? So we're going to have to think a little bit more carefully about our major species on this. So we have our hydrochloric. And what would be the concentration of our hydrogen ions? Same thing, yeah, because it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Now, when we talked about our major species, we talked about the hydrogen, the chloride, and there was one other component here that we really haven't mentioned. Water, the component that's actually making this dissolve, we haven't talked about. But what did we say happens with water? It's amphoteric and it also auto ionizes. It makes hydrogens and hydroxides. Well, the trick here is would it be possible for water to be a better source of hydrogen ions than our acid? Could that be a possibility? It could be because the KW, remember, equals the hydrogen times the hydroxide. And what was the value for KW? 1 times 10 to the negative 14th. Um, what do we know has to be true about these things? They have to be the same here. So can we make them both X? Because it's a one to one to one ratio, so they would have to be. If this change, if this changes by x, then that has to change by x as well. So it becomes x squared. So, what's the concentration of x? It will always be a one-to-one -one with, with water. Um, the, when we get into some bases, we'll see some cases where it's not one-to-one. -one. Acids are always one-to-one. -one. What's the concentration of X? So 
So, who's the better hydrogen ion producer? Are we getting more hydrogen ions from our strong acid? Or are we getting more hydrogen ions from water? We're getting more from water. Water gives more hydrogen ion concentration. What's the pH? 7. pH is 7. So the one thing that, what I would like you to pull from this is to watch for extremely low concentrations of acids, of strong acids. Because as the concentration of the strong acid gets smaller and smaller, then there has a potential for the water to become more important. So in this case, this is why we did this problem, because this is such a low concentration of the strong acid, it has the potential now to make water more important. It's our contributor of the hydrogen ions. Any questions? Okay, let's get to the good stuff. Because strong are really boring. I mean, they just dissociate, you take negative log, there's nothing to them. Let's talk weak, because they're fun. That's where you get to practice our small k problems again, because they're all small k. So calculating the pH of a weak acid. I want you to write this in bold letters, set it on fire, write it in blood, do something so you remember this. This is the key to the next three chapters. This is the key. Weak equals ice. You can remember this. You'll know exactly what to do with every single problem. If it is weak, I must do a what? Ice chart. If, it, if I did an ice chart, then it must have been weak. If it's strong, no ice. It just associates. So weak equals ice. This is the key to this. So you'll need to use um, the ice chart and approximations. This is the 5% rule right here. We take an approximation that's saying ignore the change do the, the small k. Um, and you should check the 5% rule. And we're actually going to find out checking the 5% rule actually ends up calculating something else for us. We actually learn the percent dis dissociation of the acid. So we actually get two answers with one problem. So what we want to do is calculate the pH of one molar hydrofluoric acid that has a Ka of 7.2 times 10 to the negative fourth. Now, let's look at context clues. Let's say I couldn't remember that hydrofluoric acid is weak. If I can't remember that hydrofluoric acid is weak, what else is here that tells me it's weak? You have a Ka, and Ka's are only for weak acids. So this is a weak acid, weak equals ice. So we're going to have to do our ice chart. Nope. No. Um, let me go back one. I'm going to add in a slide. Okay. So when we dissociate our HF, our weak acid, one arrow, two arrows. Two, it's got to go both ways. And what is it going to dissociate into? Hydrogen ions and fluoride ions. And we said weak equals? And I believe we had a concentration for this, right? It was one molar. And that's the only thing we have. So what are we going to do to our hydrogen and our fluoride? Yeah, they're going to be zero initially. So that means 
automatically which way do we have to shift? We have to shift to the right. What's the change in F, uh, HS going to be? Minus X. What's going to be the change in these? Plus X. Is this seeming familiar to you? This is 1 minus X. 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 Um, oh, whoops. I, yes, but I don't want to say that you might not run into one where it's not. I would say 99% of the time it's always a one-to-one -one ratio, yes. Right, and so that's the very next thing. These are all small k problems, so we're going to cross this out because that is a small k. Now, what do you have to do first? Equilibrium expression. Ka equals the hydrogen times the fluoride. all over the hydrofluoric acid and we will pick up there tomorrow but I bet you can finish it from here it's just a regular old KA